Hi, my name is Eliza, and I'm the director of the School of the New Testament. Wow, that was beautiful. Good, good standing, everyone. Um, I'm the director of the School of the New Testament here, and we are going to take a moment to read God's word. Today's reading comes from Mark chapter 9, verses 21 through 24. It says, so Jesus asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. And often he has thrown him both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus said to him, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. Immediately, the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. This is the word of the Lord. You can go ahead and have a seat. Well, good morning. Uh, what a joy to be with you. If I haven't had the chance to meet you, my name is Phil, and I have the privilege of being the lead pastor here uh, at the square, and uh, just honored to to, to be with you and to worship Jesus together. Uh, and if you're new to our community or this is your first time in any way, I just want you to know you're loved and you're welcome. And uh, like you heard on the video that we shared, uh, just excited to have a season where we step into prayer and um, excited to, to even start that tonight. This, this moment of the scripture that Eliza read is one of those stories in, in the heart of the New Testament uh, that, has, that has in many ways like framed uh, an understanding of my own life. And, and it's, it's, it's a powerful moment because in many ways it just represents something so deeply human. I, I'm not going to, to look at the actual story or preach from the context of that actual story, which is really unique and Jesus engaging with a father who's, whose child is, is being terrorized in, in this place by demonic activity and comes to Jesus and makes this request. But there's, there's something in the nature of it that defines elements of my life and I think defines elements of yours too. And, and it, that line, right, he says, if you can. And there's something about that line that is so deeply human. If you can, if you hear, if you see me, if you care, if you could, if you're real, right? It's the, there's something about the if you that so lives in us as humans. And that Jesus responds and, and, and invites him into this moment of faith. And then of course, his response, I, I believe, help my unbelief. This, this way of, of in the invitation of faith, coming before Jesus and saying, this is what I've got. This is the best of what I can bring to the table. I believe you and I don't believe you. I have faith and I don't have faith. That's what I have. Is that enough? Is that enough? And what I love about this moment is it actually helps us understand in this journey of faith, in this life of faith, this very human portrait that we bring to the table, because I would tell you that this moment describes the tension that we all know, because in us is the tension of faith and not faith, belief and not belief. It is so pervasive in our culture as our cultural beliefs have changed and the structure of belief itself has changed. It, it's brought this, um, this almost stagnant agnosticism into every element of our lives, no matter whether we're people of faith or not people of faith. It's, it's, it's as if this tension has permeated so deeply in the midst of our faith is always the haunting voice of unbelief. And in the midst of our unbelief is always the tempting voice of faith. Leads us to this almost inability to, to come into place. Can we believe? How do we believe? What about things we don't believe? And what does it mean to be a people of faith? And I believe that to understand what it means to be a people of faith, we, we have to hear the invitation that rests in the tension, that rests in the very nature of coming to Jesus and saying, if you want to know it's true, I believe and I don't. 
I'm in and I'm out. I've got it both in me. And I know that. I think you do too. There's lots of moments from my own life that have ultimately come to this point of this intersection of what do I do with the tension that's in me. My life has been marked by these places. Two, two that I've shared before, but come to my mind because I think they capture so much of the invitation of, of faith. Or the, the first it was actually in Emily and I feeling called to move here to Atlanta to, to plant the square. I mean, if you looked at the year, year and a half prior to that, it was this slow journey where God was so clearly leading us. His voice was loud. He, he met us every step of the way. We felt undeniably that God was inviting us to leave Seattle, to move to Atlanta, to plant a church. And there was things he was doing in the midst of it. And then we arrived and my world spun because I didn't understand that in arriving, suddenly all of my greatest fears would come to life. And all of my insecurities would actually find their way forward. And, and I remember in this season feeling overwhelmed by this idea that, that I didn't feel capable of planting a church. I, I distinctly remember this night because I went to Grace Midtown and it was, a, it was actually it was 10 years ago. It was a beautiful experience, this worship night. It was so meaningful in my own life. Like, and, I, and it was on one hand, this level of encouragement, but then it was this, it, it, it like was almost a uh, discouraging for me personally, because I, I saw that I go, if that's what it looks like to see a gathered community of people who love Jesus, I can't do that. It, it, was, it was like some portrait of my inabilities. And I remember that night telling Jesus, you, you've asked me to do something I can't do. I am not capable of this. You've sent me to Atlanta to fail. And I don't know what to do with that. It was a moment of the tension of I believe and I don't believe. The tension and the invitation of faith. Another, which is often the challenge of our lives, was in moments of suffering. Not shortly after that time, uh, Emily uh, and I had a stillbirth for our son Peter. And we were new to Atlanta. And even though we had friends and frameworks, all of the substantial relationships of my life were still in Seattle. And, and I, in the hospital, alone, after the doctors had left, after Peter had been born and taken, I just was overwhelmed with grief. And I remember the middle of the night, three, four in the morning, walking out into the hallway, it was utterly empty. I, I remember distinctly just all I wanted to do was, was uh, be able to talk to my older brother, right? Just that, 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 that was the overwhelming feeling. Alone, abandoned, and unsure what to do. As what happens when we experience levels of suffering in our lives. And that moment was a, a place of tension. And it was also a place of invitation. And I think that this is in many ways what life leads us to, but ultimately the scriptures are also trying to help us understand is that it's, it's in the tension where faith holds moments of such profound uncertainty that actually is also the invitation of why faith matters. And this morning, I want to just maybe for 15 to 20 minutes try to, to walk with you in, 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 a, in a, how the author of Hebrews, as we're, as we're all this teaching series, we're letting Hebrews chapter 11 define this trajectory for us of the life of faith. I believe that the author of Hebrews has something he wants to teach us. And so I want to be faithful to that. So for the next few minutes, I want, I want to try to teach you what I believe the author of Hebrews is trying to teach you. And then I want to just take some time and I want to exhort you into what I believe that means for our lives. Because I think what we find is that faith is always gonna lead us to somewhere. Faith is always gonna lead us to this place that I call the field of impossibilities. Faith will always lead you to the field of impossibilities. And the field of impossibilities ultimately is the tension that we experience. And I believe that when we don't know how to navigate that tension, the tension itself will consume us. But 
to understand this invitation, I think we, we have to stand on the identity of faith. That's what we talked about last week. So if you weren't here, and, and uh, I would encourage you, if you have time, go back and listen. Uh, it's not a, a self grandiose statement. I think the teaching could have been far better than it is, but I do think it's helpful. And, and it'll help you because I, I believe that it's a right understanding of the identity of faith because there's a lot of forms of distorted faith that is the only thing that can invite us into the invitation of faith. But just even as a quick summation, this was the substance of what we talked about last week. Four things. What is the identity of faith? Faith is what connects us to God. So, so faith is the very thing that actually unites us into relationship with God. Faith doesn't save us. But faith unites us to God to experience his salvation work, his redemption, his transformation in our life. So faith is that vehicle that connects me to God. Second, distinctly Christian faith is the belief of the trustworthiness of Jesus and the gospel. It, it, it is an actual belief of the claims of Jesus are credible. The claims of his existence, his life, his death, and his resurrection are not just something I somehow wishful thinking hope is true, but it's something I can pursue and come to deep conviction intellectually, emotionally, relationally, archeologically, historically, and go, I place my faith in this. Third faith is a present possession of a future hope. It's, it's, this is what makes it so mysterious. It is actually something, it's not just an idea. It is some kind of substance that I take a possession of in the here and now, but it's a possession of in the here and now that speaks to a future thing I don't yet have. So it's in the present and in the future and somehow is leading my life from the present to the future. And it connects me to hope. And fourth, faith is the holistic embodiment of agreeing with God over my emotions and my circumstances. So it's this, it's this place where then I come into faith and I agree with God and not with maybe the present emotions of my life, though I don't dismiss or dishonor my emotions, or my circumstances, though I don't downplay or minimize them. But this becomes the identity of faith. And so what is this faith actually inviting us into? And I believe this is what the author of Hebrews begins to reveal to us. And he does it through the stories of Abraham and Sarah. Abraham and Sarah, uh, the patriarch and matriarch of the people of Israel, the covenant family of God. It's, it's to Abraham that God makes this promise that you will have a son and I, you will have a descendant and you will have a lineage and you can count the stars, Abraham, and so great shall your family be. He makes a promise and Abraham becomes the promise uh, or the son of the promise of God that he is going to build a covenant family in the world that partners with God for the sake of the mission and the heartbeat of God. This is the birth of the beauty of the people of Israel. And for those of us who follow Jesus, this is what we believe, that in the power of Jesus, we now get grafted in through faith. That what Paul says is now in faith, those of us who are from Gentile backgrounds, everybody else, right, somehow know because Abraham isn't just the father of Israel, he's the father of faith. And so when you and I actually enter into faith, now we actually somehow receive this promise that was given to him. This, the stories of Abraham and Sarah are the anchors of of so many things in our heart and our lives and our understanding. And so the author of Hebrews says, I want you to understand something about the invitation of faith and I'm gonna do it through these moments of their own lives. And so the author of Hebrews walks us through three moments of Abraham and Sarah's life to help us understand the invitation of faith. This is what he says, Hebrews 11, starting in verse eight. So by faith, Abraham, when uh, called to go to a place that he would later receive as an inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were his heirs of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and builder was God. So the author of Hebrews is saying that Abraham, his life in this moment, is telling us about the invitation of faith. And what he's saying is that Abraham received the promise of a home for his family and his descendants, but obtaining that promise had to go through somewhere. It had to go through this field of impossibilities. Just to practically 
kind of name it. What was the promise? The promise was a home. But what was the impossibility? That home belonged to other people. There, were, there was now a promise and an impossibility. And it was the connection point of those two worlds created this place that Abraham needed to walk through. This place I call these fields of impossibilities. And faith was in that tension, inviting Abraham in. That's what we have to see. Faith has an identity, but faith has an invitation. And the tension is the awakened place of the invitation of faith in our lives. And faith was inviting Abraham. Faith was inviting Abraham to trust God. Fill his promise of fill his promise even of though home. Abraham, even though Abraham, Abraham was incapable of making that home himself. Of making that home himself. That's what we see happening. That's what we see. The doctor of continues in the doctor of Hebrews continues in faith. And, 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 and by faith, even was past childbearing age. Who was past childbearing able to bear children because she was unable to bear children because she considered him faithful. And so from this one man, and so from this one man. A little unkind, author of Hebrews, whoever you are. I get he was old, but we could say that in a more honoring way, right? That Abraham, good as dead, right? Came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and countless as the sand on the seashore. So again, we, we, we see this, this invitation and the tension. Sarah receives a promise of a child, but obtaining that promise has to go through a place. This field of impossibilities. And again, practically, what is the promise? The promise is a son. But what's the impossibility? Her age. The time has come and gone for her to conceive, for her to bear a child. This is no longer a biological reality in her stage of life. There is a promise and there is an impossibility and there is a tension that presents himself in the middle. But faith, faith was what? Faith was inviting Sarah to trust God to fulfill the promise of a son when she could not produce a son on her own. The author of Hebrews continues this third story, right? Verse 17, by faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had embraced the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son, even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring shall be reckoned. Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead, and in so, in so in a manner, in speaking, he did receive Isaac back from the dead. Now, this, this story has a lot of elements to it, and I'm not here to actually like, look at this story uniquely and try to teach from it, but I, I think the fact that the author of Hebrews is using this as an example, and it is an important example for me, I always, I think it matters that we understand when we read the story about Abraham and Isaac, it awakens that tension of faith, <laughs> because it's a a request that we don't know what to do with. But th this is what we have to understand about the story of Abraham and Isaac. And first of all, I, I take nothing from the sovereignty of God. And I take nothing. God is, if he is who he says he is, it means he is God Almighty and we are dust that he supernaturally keeps together through laws of physics. If this is true, then I take nothing away from God being able to do whatever he deems to be right. But this moment between Abraham and Isaac it is not a moment that its primary understanding is about a test of faith. Though certainly, Abraham is being deeply tested in his faith, and I think it's actually an element of what's happening. What's actually happening in the story is that God is revealing to Abraham, the covenant father of faith, what he's actually like. And in Abraham's day, in Abraham's age, in Abraham's world, the kind of request that God was making was the kind of request that God's make. If you want to establish right relationship with God, then you have, to, you have to offer things of the greatest consequence, like your children. This would have been normal to Abraham. It's unthinkable to us, but it's normal to him. And Abraham, in this place of faith, actually steps into this reality. But the great lesson of Abraham and Isaac is not about an exchange or a lesson of faith. It is actually about God's revelation to Abraham and to us, which is pointing us towards the coming of Jesus, that it, the divide between man and God will never be solved by the sacrifice of our kids, it'll only be solved by God giving his son for us. That he's trying to tell Abraham, this is what I'm like. Isaac isn't going to fix what's between us, Abraham. Isaac can't do what you think it can do. There's only one son. 
There's only one son that can heal the divide. It's actually a prophetic imagery as the Old Testament does over and over and over again, pointing us towards the heart of God, of the heart of Jesus, the one who would come and lay down his life willingly to heal what has been broken between us. This, this is the heart of that story. But in this moment, Abraham doesn't understand this. God is revealing his character and his nature and it's radical faith. How would you like to be given a promise and a second place of obedience that are in direct opposition to each other and to know how to hold those? But don't also think that Isaac was a young man at this point with an elderly father. Part of what we misunderstand about the story is that Isaac was in agreement with it. it was, Isaac was actually there with Abraham, willing to do what God asked, not, not outside of that. But this is what this story reveals to us, right? Abraham received a promise of a family so great that it would be like the stars in the sky and the, the sand on the shore. But obtaining that promise had to go through a same place, a field of impossibilities. Well, what was the promise? Descendants distinctly through Isaac. It's not, just pro it's not just descendants. The promise was that this would go through Isaac. What's the impossibility? It's hard to have descendants for a son who's died. Faith was inviting Abraham to trust God that his son Isaac would fulfill God's promises while being asked to sacrifice Isaac. And he could not both sacrifice his son and see his son get married and have children. The, the, the invitation of faith existed in the very tension of it. It created a field of impossibilities that Abram had to journey through. But when you think about it, this is what's so remarkable about Abraham's faith in that moment. He, he thought to himself, I don't know how these two promises can go together, but I'm confident enough in God's character then I guess he'll just raise Isaac from the dead because he's not going to go back on his promise. And this invitation of faith had to lead him into the very places he feared the most. And I think these three stories, they, they actually, they, they help us understand the invitation of faith that comes from the tension. And the first, right, is this this, what is the invitation of faith? If faith has an invitation, the first is that we would learn how to believe God's promises, right? If you go to that slide, it brings up those three things. I think that, that ultimately this is what we, we begin to see, that there's an initial invitation of faith. Believing God for promises that are impossible on our own abilities. And, and first and foremost, I believe that's the promises of who God is and how he reveals himself through his word, the promises of scripture, Old Testament, New Testament, revealing the character and the nature of God. But I believe in our lives, we also, as God is real and present and moving, there are promises that in alignment with that, he comes and he speaks to us. Faith is, the invitation of faith is to believe God for his promises that he places over us. But the second isn't, isn't just this place, because belief in the scriptures is never purely intellectual. It's never about something cognitive, though it connects to our thinking and our intellectual concepts. But the, but the second invitation of faith is not that we just somehow believe a concept, but that we actually hold on to the substance that we talked about last week, that, that faith actually, when we receive it, is something that's pointing towards a future hope. And, and the invitation of faith is first that I would believe God, that he would be faithful to his promises, but second is that I would learn to trust God in the midst of holding on to who he is and what he says in the midst of the trials that are happening around my life and the tension of this field of impossibilities. And the third would be this invitation of faith lived out fully, right? Which is that I would live a faithfulness and obedience in alignment with who I believe God is and what I believe he says, even in the midst of what feels impossible, that I would align my heart and my life with the promises of God, even if it aligns my life with the field of impossibilities. That the faith is an invitation to journey through a place we cannot journey ourselves. 
And it reminds me again of another moment, Jesus in Luke 18, he's, he's actually having an exchange with what the scriptures call a rich young ruler about the dialogue of what does it mean to actually belong with Jesus? How do you, how do you belong with God? How, how do you find salvation? And they have this whole uh, dialogue exchange around faith and wealth and Jesus corrects their idea that somehow money is an indicator of God's favor in people's lives. And, and if you're rich, it means God likes you more. He actually says quite the opposite, not that he doesn't like you more, but that the challenges of wealth actually will often stop people from finding who God really is. And the, the disciples say, then who can be saved? And Jesus says this line, what is possible, what is impossible with man is possible with God. That Jesus is describing the tension the invitation, and the field of impossibilities where faith is always trying to lead us. But see, this is what we have to begin to see. So faith is an invitation that's always leading me to a place. And that place is the tension point between the promises of God and the impossibilities of my own capable strength. But this is what we miss, is those fields of impossibilities the reason God's leading us to them is because they are the places we fear the most. It's the places where fear is actually navigating the future of our life. God is not inviting you to places of these fields of impossibilities just as some like strange God litmus test to see what you're like. He's not just like up in heaven going, well, let's just throw a trial their way and see how they do this time. No, no, no. God is actually intentionally and importantly and specifically leading your life to a unique place for you, but it's the same place for all of us. The field of impossibilities, because the field of impossibilities are where the giants of your fear live. And what Jesus is actually trying to do is teach you how to walk in faith so that he can deliver you from the very fears that are controlling you. God is trying to rescue you See, this is what we miss about faith and why it matters so much is that God is doing it for my redemptive good. He is not somehow playing a cosmic test in the world. He is a loving father saying, son, I'm tired of you allowing fear to dominate the future of your life. And I'm entering you into a place and it's a place where you're going to learn who you really are and who I really am and what I've placed inside of you. And it's going to be hard, but your life is too important to let the fears of the future navigate who you are. So I'm going to invite you into this field and you're going to hate it because it's tense and it's uncertain and it's something you can't do on your own. It's the field of impossibilities because God is addressing the authorities of our life. Your life will only be led by three things. There's lots of things that fall underneath this, but your life will be led by fear, by what's capable in your own mind of yourself, so self-assurance or faith. There's no fourth option. Your future, between now and whatever future you believe in, whatever future you're longing for, whatever future you're holding to, what you believe God has placed in your life, one of those three things is gonna navigate it. Fear, faith, or self. And often self is just our best attempt at what we're capable of in the midst of our fear. But this is what God is doing in the field of impossibilities is he's coming alongside of us as a rescuer. He's coming alongside of us as a deliverer. He's coming alongside of us as a father because he no longer wants to let fear navigate our future. Matt, you can come up. I'm going to close. And in this picture of these three things, like I think I saw, um, I saw it in this framework that was helpful for me and I think might be helpful for you. So if, if God is, if faith is inviting me to this very place and there's an invitation about faith and these, somehow these three things describe it, it's almost in my mind like I saw this picture that God is inviting me into this journey through the impossible possible and he gives me a map and he gives me a compass and he gives me a way. And these three things become the substance 
of how I'm meant to navigate the impossible places of my future. The map of the promises of God, the compass of trust and the way of faithful obedience. There's, he's, he's equipping me to walk through the fields of my fear. And I think the question then is like, well, how is this helpful to answer the tension? If the tension creates the uncertainty that causes us to freeze or have faith and not faith, belief and not belief, but you're telling me it's also the invitation and the equipping to how to walk through that, then how does the invitation help me? Because there's this incredibly subtle thing in these stories that we often miss and look over. The story of Abraham, Abraham and his home, the story of Sarah and her son, and the story of Abraham and his descendants. All of them, in the tension, were invited into the journey of faith. But their faith was not in the promise, but the promise giver. And see, this is what we misunderstand about faith. That you and I, as we're invited into these moments in our lives, we, we get these false and distorted forms of faith that, that make us somehow not be able to hold on to what God actually has, right? This, this, this idea, distorted faith puts faith in the strength of one's ability to believe perfectly. That's, that's distorted faith. If I just could believe perfectly enough, then maybe I could walk through this impossible, possible thing. Not true. Our faith is not in how great your faith can be, though I think God wants to strengthen and encourage our faith. Our faith, thank God, is the one who's faithful even when we remain faithless. And in the opening story, let me remind you that you can come to Jesus and go, I've got it and I don't. You wanna know the truth, God, where I'm at? I need your help and I believe you and I don't believe you. That's where my faith is at. And Jesus doesn't go, dang, man, I wish it. Like if it was 75%, could have done it. No, it's a, our faith is not in our faith. Our faith is the one who holds even the most fragile faith and is faithful. Faith is defined by our emotions and our circumstance puts our faith in our situation. So we'll always be guided by our situation. We'll always be governed by our pursuit of happiness. And I just say this so often to you, but I mean it. I, I make no enemy of happiness. When your desires and your storylines line up, happiness will be produced. I bless you with happiness, but happiness is way too cheap a vision of life because what you were made for is gonna have to take you through suffering. It's gonna have to take you through sacrifice. It's gonna have to take you through moments you don't wanna go through, but it's the place you were made for. So when you, when you place faith in your emotions and your circumstances, then you'll just, you'll navigate somewhere you don't really belong. Faith is the opposite of reason. Right? This is this idea of faith is somehow setting aside reason and making this leap into the unknown. Well, all, all that's gonna do is you're gonna have faith in a character of a God you don't know. It's not faith. Faith is absolutely standing in things that can't be seen, but there is an evidence in which we stand. Faith that avoids suffering ultimately is just trying to bargain with God. So it's faith in our ability to manipulate him out of storylines we don't want in our life, rather than seeing that suffering is an element that God walks us through for his redemptive joy in our lives. Because Abram, when he considered his home, he didn't stand in the faith of a promise. He stood in the faith of a promise giver. He was looking for a home built by God. He anchored his faith somewhere. When Sarah, it says when Sarah was being invited into this impossible, possible place, she said she considered him who was faithful she didn't put her faith in going, okay, somehow there's gonna be this magical way that I conceive a child. My faith is in this thing happening. No, she just looked at saying, do I believe God's character? And she placed her faith in the one who was faithful in the midst of a storyline. She didn't know what to do with Abraham when he was walking Isaac up the mountain and said, I don't know how, I don't know how, 
to be obedient to you, God, and to believe for your promises. He didn't place his faith that somehow, even though God comes in and he intervenes in the story, that's not where Abraham's faith is. Abraham didn't ask for, he, he, didn't, he didn't try to move it this way. His faith was in this place saying, I know your character. So the only logical idea I can come up with is I guess that you're gonna raise Isaac from the dead because you are faithful. He places his faith in the promise giver. And see, that's when you place your faith in the promise giver. That's where the map and the compass and the way begin to emerge in this field of impossibilities and God begins to do what you can't do on your own. And that's the invitation of faith and why we must reclaim this thing that stands behind me every Sunday. And I'm not talking about Matt, though he does stand behind me nearly every Sunday. We love you, Matt. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Because it's not a question of if you're going to walk through fields of impossibilities, you are walking through them right now. And what is going to anchor you in the midst of the impossible possible? What is gonna anchor you in the navigation of life from here to your future? I'm telling you only one thing can. And it's that Jesus Christ doesn't change. He's faithful when I'm faithless. He's kind and compassionate, slow to anger, rich in love. He forgives his enemies. And if he loves his enemies, how much more does he love his sons and his daughters? And he who is for me, then who can be against me? There's a trust not in the circumstances. There's a trust not even in the promises. It's a trust in the faithful one. And there's no one you can trust in the field of impossibility other than the one who makes impossible things possible. That's the invitation of faith. Because God's looking to actually stand up to your giants. He's looking to stand up to your Goliaths. He's looking to stand up to the fears in the field and say, I'm tired of how these things are determining how you view yourself, how you view your future and what you are capable of. We're gonna walk through a field of impossibilities because I'm about to rescue you. See, what happened in my life, in this place of moving to Atlanta, was I was gripped with my insecurities gripped also with my pride. Who was I if I wasn't known? Who was I if I wasn't someone? Who was I if I couldn't plant a church? Yeah, I think God sent me to Atlanta to plant a church. But I can tell you more confidently is he sent me to Atlanta to rescue me. The field of impossibility that was in front of me were the fears that were distorting me. And he sent me on a journey through impossible things with a map and a compass and a way and a, and, a, and a way to learn his faithfulness and those months later that Emily and I stood in that room I came back in and I grabbed Emily's hand we didn't know what to do so we just worshiped Jesus In the hallway was the voice. You can't trust God. He's gonna let you fail. Look what's happening in your life. You weren't good enough, weren't capable enough. He's not faithful. He's gonna let hard things happen to you. He's gonna crush your life as a demonstration to others. The, the things that the spin in suffering but it was there in the midst of great loss because sometimes this is what faith has to do. Faith isn't just navigating me towards my future. It's navigating me through pain because God's not a liar. Jesus, this is what makes Jesus so trustworthy. He told me, he told us, you are going to face trials of many kinds. That is not outside of the sphere of God's care. And so it was there Emily and I grabbed hands and we stood in one thing, the one thing we knew. He's faithful. And the presence of God filled that hospital room. And in the midst of such loss was such peace. I don't have the answers to the mystery of suffering, but I can tell you in the mystery of suffering, there's one thing I know. 
He's for me. He's not against me. He goes in front of me and walks behind me. He illuminates my path. He keeps my feet. He makes sure that I don't fall to the left or the right. He holds me up. He's gripping me in his hand and he loves me. He loves me so much. He would take my place in death. So whatever suffering is there, it's in the midst of his character, not around it. And so this is what God longs for, faith. Because this invitation in the midst of the tension is actually about your future being fully alive. And the God who walks you into these places wants to rescue and deliver you. And so my simple question to you is what are your fields of impossibility? What are they? They're there. You might have silenced them or pushed mute on them or let them go numb, but they're there because God's actually trying to rescue your life. And he's trying to teach you how to hold on to his character in the midst of all things. And when you can hold on to his character in the midst of all things, you begin to enter into the impossible possible the life of faith. And you might say back to me, my faith doesn't feel strong enough for that. I would say, I understand. That's what we're gonna talk about next week, that God wants to strengthen your faith. But let me just tell you, he can't strengthen what you can't name. And it's time for you to name the fields and possibility and the giants and the fears and the lies that no longer have the right to, to lead your future. Come on, would you stand with me? Prayer teams, you can come and make yourself available. I'm just gonna pray for us. And if we can pray, um, come let us pray. Um, Jesus, we today, we just, we recognize that we come to you filled with faith and unbelief. And I, I, I want that to change, but my confidence is not in me, it's in you. And I believe in this season, you actually wanna teach us how to be a people of radical faith, to walk into these journeys alongside of you. Lord, I bless my church, I bless my friends. Lord, where fear is looming, would you just bring peace? Lord, just like the examples of Abraham and Sarah, would you bring flesh and blood examples of those in our community who have walked through the fields of impossibility and can tell us the stories of what God is like. Come and help, come and heal, come and lead. In Jesus' name, amen. Listen, if we can pray, please let us pray. If not, uh, just have an incredible rest of your day. I need a tissue, clearly. I don't know how bad it looks, but... I can feel how bad it feels. So listen, may God bless you and keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you. May he turn his countenance to you. And may you know everywhere you go this week, you are radically loved by God. God bless you, friends. Have an incredible rest of your day. Come let us pray if we can.